Live from New York City, it's The Gary Null Show. And now, your host, Gary Null. Hi, I'm Gary Null. Nice to have you with us today. Brand new information every single day, including this from the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom. Do you care about your skin? Of course you do. Billions of dollars are spent each year protecting our skin or enhancing or try to get more moisture into the skin or hold what's in there as we age, keep the skin from thinning. Well, one thing that can help you, you probably didn't know, was green tea supplements. Yes, they help you when you take oral supplements of green tea. I suggest between 200 to 300 milligrams, and it protects against sunburn and the longer-term effects of ultraviolet damage. That's according to a new study. Skin levels of green tea catechins, these are compounds, increase following taking green tea for 12 weeks. And these increased levels were associated with significantly lower levels of inflammatory markers when skin was exposed to ultraviolet radiation. This was published in the British Journal of Nutrition. So just one more way that we can keep ourselves healthier, keep our skin healthier, and by the way, for all of you runners or people going out to exercise in the hot weather, let's say you're in California, Nevada, Florida, New Mexico, et cetera, Texas, there's a lot that you can do. For example, you can enhance the health of trapping the free radicals from the radiation from the sun by taking 500 milligrams of vitamin C before you go out for a workout. They only took 50 milligrams of vitamin C, just 50, and it helped them. 500 milligrams, I believe, is much more realistic and much more adequate. And But wear clothing, and there's lots of different lines of clothing that block at least 50% of the sun. So therefore, you're far less likely to get the uh, damaging effects of excess sun. And you can always tell, especially in California, I would see... I'm sure you saw those movies of everybody on the beach and uh, nobody really protecting themselves. Look at those people 10 and 20 years later. Their skin has really toughened up. It's uh, ruddy looking, lots of wrinkles, deep lines. That's what happens. So just a way of helping us. Another way of helping us comes from Tufts University. They have a study showing that vitamin D supplements can protect millions from developing type 2 diabetes. But we also know that if you watch your diet, if you have healthy kidneys and liver, if you're eating a, a lot of fiber, quality fiber, drinking plenty of clean water, if nothing else, reverse osmosis water. It's inexpensive, and you'll get your minerals, not from that because they've removed them, but they've removed all the bacteria, parasites, anything is bad. So reverse osmosis is the best as far as safety. Then where do you get your calcium, magnesium? You'll get it from a healthy diet. In any case, vitamin D is very important to protect yourself against diabetes. Now, recently, I had a group of people in my audience who did a study. And we saw how many were deficient in vitamin D. Now, mind you, this is my audience. People, oh, I've been listening for 20, 30, 40 years. And why aren't you adequate in your vitamin D or vitamin C? So even if you pay attention, you still have to actualize. And by actualizing, once or twice a year, get a simple, inexpensive profile done of your blood. You go in to take a sample of the blood, and then you see, do you have enough vitamin K to mineralize your bones? Do you have enough vitamin D, magnesium, calcium, potassium, or on. All of these are important, but vitamin D in particular can help you prevent diabetes. Now, we have a lot of Americans with prediabetes and diabetes, upwards of 90 to 100 million. But according to Tufts Medical Center, taking supplements can lead to a 15% drop in the likelihood of developing the condition among adults and prediabetics. They found that over a three-year follow-up period, New onset diabetes occurred 22% of adults who received vitamin D compared to 25% among those who took a placebo. <clears throat> That's not a big difference, but here's what they didn't do, but we have. 
get people to exercise 10,000 steps or more per day, ideally 20,000 steps, both resistance and aerobic exercise, get them to have between 30 to 40 grams of quality fiber each day in their diet, get them also to take chromium picanolate, vitamin C, quercetin, and vitamin D3. That'll make a difference. There's no reason that we can't prevent type 2 diabetes. We can. In the past month or two, I've discussed on many occasions the power of mindful meditation. What it does, it lowers the biomarkers for stress response in anxiety disorders. It can help children with ADHD. It can help adults who have hyperactive behavior, especially those who are wired to caffeine. So taking a 15-minute meditation break in the afternoon can make a big difference. This study was done at Georgetown University Medical Center, a rigorously designed National Institute of Health-sponsored clinical trial led by the medical center has found objective physiological evidence that mindfulness meditation combats anxiety. Now let's go back about seven years. Seven years ago, I did a study with 500 people over a three-month period, June, July, and August, at a church that held 500 people. So that's how many we had. And we had almost no dropouts. To get into the study, everyone had to have been diagnosed. And we had to have a letter from their physician that their therapist, that they were either suffering from clinical depression or clinical anxiety for at least two years. But it was longer. Some people had been clinically diagnosed for seven, one guy for 27 years, and almost all were on medications, anti-anxiety or anti-depressive medications. On the very first day we had everyone film, took about five hours, but they would get up and give their name and their age, how long they had been depressed or anxious, what medications they were on, how they felt, and especially if they had a sense of hopelessness or despair or suicide, and a lot had anxiety about suicide. But then when I asked them, did you read the package insert, that one of the top side effects of your anti-anxiety medication was suicidal ideation. They hadn't read it. Their doctor had not explained that to them. With no medical intervention, even though we had a full medical staff there, headed by Dr. Martin Feldman, a board-certified neurologist, we started by doing mindful meditation. We would spend about an hour each week on different techniques, take the whole group through mindful meditation. We suggested they uh, get themselves some CDs. One of the most popular was flute music, meditative flute music, then water, uh, rainstorms, uh, rain hitting a, a tin roof, and uh, they really benefited from that. People who had not been able to sleep because they were anxious, or depressed, we're able to sleep through the night. And then we began to detoxify the body, cleaning up the body. But behind all of this was staying mindful. And we would do exercises. We would pair people off and say things that would make a person stressed or depressed. Well, words today are being used in a weaponizing way. We don't say something, uh, let's say, ang out of anger or spite, or vengeance to someone that is kind and thoughtful. We weaponize. We want to hurt the person with our words. We want them to feel bad about themselves. And this is so wrong. Remember, words are powerful. And some people have grown up believing that how they feel is what's important. And therefore, if you say something that they suddenly cause a trigger reaction where they're thinking, wow, that hurt me. And then someone just keeps piling on because it's rare that someone says something that shouldn't be said and then immediately apologize saying, hold on a second, I, I shouldn't have said that. That was very unkind and you don't deserve that. We can differ. We have different opinions, but, but let's be realistic. I wouldn't want someone saying that to me. So I'm sure that being on the receiving end of something that I said was hurtful. Can, can you accept my apology? More often than not, a person will. Um, but just remember, whoever creates that word 
is doing so with the intent of harm. And mindful meditation in our exercises, we would take a person and say, now go to a go to a place that's calm. Just the mantra calm, calm, relax. And then when someone would say something, we would find that it didn't trigger them. We were even taking blood pressure and pulse rates because your pulse goes up real fast. Let's say you have a resting pulse of 70 and someone says something you don't like and it goes up to 80. That's not good because right behind that's high blood pressure. You take anyone who's had an argument, anyone who's in a stressful position and look at their blood pressure through the roof. That means that they are greater risk of a stroke or a heart attack. In fact, a lot of people are unaware that getting angry and yelling frees micro strokes, tiny little strokes in the brain. Not enough to where you even know you've had a stroke. But on autopsy, they found all these little white specks all over the brain. Didn't know what it was. It's not amyloid plaque, as you would see in dementia or Alzheimer's. No, the, this is from strokes. And each one of those is bad because you never know when a little stroke can become a dead stroke. So anyhow, the mindful meditation allowed a person to say, it's okay, it's just words. So if I said, uh, uh, gasoline station, so so what? It's gasoline station. Uh, blue sky, so what? You're ugly. Oh, suddenly, the words mean something. And that's because locked into us for every decade of life are millions of emotional minefields. And by the time you're 40, you probably have over 300 million of these in your subconscious. Now, hopefully you're in good situations, you're balanced, you know you're okay, you like yourself. So you're not going to allow someone to hit the third rail of that subconscious thought to cause you to overreact. In which case, then with mindful meditation, and yoga, and deep breathing, you can let it go. You know, that, that mindful meditation is like putting a number all over your head in a rainstorm, right? That's the key. So it makes a big difference when you're engaged in mindful meditation and no longer having the same reaction to anxiety-producing situations. And at a time when we need something to de-stress us because we have so many stressors going on, this is the best you can do. So we take a deep breath and we say, okay, we're all going to face problems, but it doesn't mean I have to be a victim to how I react to a problem. If that's a bad situation, I only make it worse by feeling helpless, overreacting, or going crazy. From Rockefeller University comes a study about the neurons in our gut, in our intestine, helps the immune system keep inflammation in check. Well, hold on, Gary, I thought neurons were only in the cranium, in the brain. No. No, you have an immune system. You have a second brain, not in the literal sense, but you have a literally in the sense of an immune response brain in your gut. And that's why it's so important. Rockefeller University just found that the neurons in our gut, our intestine, help the immune system keep inflammation in check. What's that mean? I thought we only had neurons in the brain. Not true. The immune system exercises constant vigilance to protect our body from external threats, including what we eat and drink. Put it this way. We can't see salmonella on a salad or botulism in some tomato soup. And yet it could be there. But the moment you eat it, the body recognizes, how does it do this? How does the body know that you just ate a toxin? Because that's how wonderful the body's immune response is. And that's why you get diarrhea, or suddenly mucus pours out, or you're coughing something out, or your temperature goes up, a virus, temperature goes up, the body's trying to destroy the virus. All this is going on without you being aware of it. That's the innate immune system. But the immune system is everywhere. But it's also really strong in your gut. 
So everything you eat and everything you drink in your lungs, everything you inhale, will either cause it to be fine, no problem, or go on full alert and try to protect you. So the neurons play a role in protecting intestinal tissue from over-inflammation. This is published in the peer-reviewed journal Cell, and the findings could help treatment implications for gastrointestinal diseases like irritable bowel syndrome, ileitis, colitis. And so the resistance to infections needs to be coupled with having a healthy diet, lots of probiotic foods and juices like beet juice, uh, sauerkraut juice, low sodium sauerkraut juice. Cabbage juice is terrific for this because you got neurons up here and you got neurons in here and they're helping your immune system with keeping your intestine without inflammation. And that's why some people have no problem, especially those who take their time before you eat. Meditating for a few minutes, going to a quiet place, slowing down everything so you're focused upon the smell, the taste, the mouthfeel, and the pleasure of what you're going to consume, even a juice. We just eat too fast. We drink too fast. We don't chew our food properly. We're almost always rushed. We're distracted. You know, have you ever seen someone in a kitchen, you know, eating something that they just put into a microwave, watching something on television or listening to radio? All distractions. And the more distractions you have, the less focus you have upon what you're doing. One of the techniques that I taught the tens of thousands of runners and walkers who came to our Natural Living Running and Walking Club, which I started in 1975, it's one of the leading running and walking clubs in America, and uh, is we do it differently. That's why we call ourselves natural living. We care about not just the training, the hard, the, you know, the, the hard road work, the cross training. No, we care about our body, our biochemistry, our mind. You can do a lot better at racing and enjoy your workouts more if you're in a mindful place, a relaxed place, a de-stressed place in your mind. And uh, so one of the things we do is we practice mindful running where we say we want to run a seven-minute mile. And without looking, one person starts the stopwatch and we run for a mile. And then he said, time hits it. It's exactly seven minutes. That's because you wake up at a certain time every day. You feel like going to sleep at a certain time, whether you do or not, your body tells you time for sleep. That's your biological clock. That's part of your circadian rhythm saying, time, time to go to sleep, time to wake up. Now, when we do things that disrupt that, when we work night shift, that's dangerous to us. Uh, when we're around electrical appliances that are throwing off electromagnetic pulses, that's really dangerous for us. And that's become acceptable. Five Gs, six Gs now coming up. All of those Gs, one, two, three, four, five, and six, all are shown to disrupt the natural chromosomes, the natural DNA in our cells, the mitochondria in our cells. There's causing a wave of environmental pollution. I published over 12 articles on this. Go to garyandall.com. Look under articles. And you'll see a whole bunch on just 5G, 10,000 studies, 10,000 on why it's dangerous, your cell phones, your computers, etc. Now, I am sitting back from my monitors and cameras here, about almost uh, four, five feet. I've tested with a meter reader exactly where it is safe. And this is where it's safe for me not to have any of the pulses. Now, everything here is hardwired. That also drops it down. Your, your real big problem is when it's wireless. Do you ever think you're in a car, you're way out in the desert, and you're having a phone conversation or the woods? All right. How did that signal? Well, the signal has to emanate, go up to a satellite. Satellite then has to bring it down to you. That takes an enormous amount of power and energy. So not only are you hearing it, but your entire side of your head and jaw and brain and eye is all being impacted with the energy, high-level vibration 
and that's been shown to cause brain cancer, jaw cancers, neurological problems, speeding up the aging of the brain. Yeah. Just the other day, I was talking with someone and they had their cell phone right here. This is a person who has a serious a breast cancer condition, yet was wearing the cell phone on, right on the, the tissue, was unaware that that might have been one of the things that caused the breast cancer. So we, we benefit from the convenience of these devices, but we're not using them safely. You can go online and get yourself some product, and you have to look at the reviews and look at the ratings that are legitimate, that can help block or absorb the electromagnetic pulses. There's a screen that you can put over your uh, monitor and your television screen, even your cell phone screen. They can help block that too. Please take advantage of those so that you keep yourself healthy. Now, another uh, important study that just came out this is from the University of Palmero uh, in Italy. Another good study that just came out is from the University of Palermo. And another good study out of Italy talks about the effects of vitamin D supplements on COVID-related intensive care hospitalizations and death. Definitive evidence from the meta-analysis, that means many different studies, to show that the results are accurate across many studies. What do I mean? The COVID-19 pandemic represents one of the world's most important challenges for global public health consciousness. Various studies have found an association between severe vitamin D deficiency and COVID-related outcomes. And recent data have suggested a protective role of vitamin D in health issues. And the purpose of this meta-analysis and trial uh, sequential analysis was to better explain the strength of the association between how much protection you get from COVID if you're taking vitamin D supplements and the risk of death or the admission to an intensive care units in patients with COVID. And they looked at different studies. They looked at 78 biographic citations from the peer review literature and they found that vitamin D has a substantial benefit to helping you keep alive and not dying if you have COVID. How about that? And also, one of the things we see in older adults is when they get depressed, they rarely come out of it. And it can lead to a premature death. The University of Connecticut has done a study showing that the mitochondria deterioration that your energy in your body deteriorates is linked to major depression. So, and, and it's understandable on one level. Look, there was a time when we looked in the mirror and we liked what we saw, all right? Then there was a time we looked in the mirror and we didn't like what we saw. And then there was a time when we didn't even look in the mirror at all because we felt, well, we're too old to get that back. And then we just kind of live with the memories or reminded when we see a photograph or Talk with someone. Oh, remember when? Yeah. Remember when we did the London, first London Marathon? And we were all 55 of us running around Hyde Park in the morning in the middle of London. It was like chariots of fire. Yeah. And now a lot of those people are older. And uh, almost 40 years ago, maybe they were 30 at the time. Now they're 70. Maybe they forgot why it was important to maintain their protocols for good health. But what happens first is you start losing your energy. And that's because of the mitochondria. We're not feeding the mitochondria. We're not taking things like PQQ, which can create new mitochondria, or NAD, which can help protect our mitochondria and protect the cells, keep the cells younger and vital longer. All important. I'm really surprised sometimes when I find out people haven't taken advantage of this beautiful continent we live on and traveled to Canada and Nova Scotia and, and Alaska. And it's just, there's different, there's different cultural patterns of food and uh, language and uh, go clear down through Mexico and uh, Panama to see the world. But you have to have a positive mindset to do that. Otherwise, you'll talk yourself out. Well, what's the big deal? 
And then that's depression. Depression can drain your energy. In the elderly, there may be very good reason for it. Depression has been linked with a deterioration of the tiny power plants of our cells. These power plants are the mitochondria, tiny structures within our cells that handle several important tasks. The most critical is producing the molecules our cells use for energy. The mitochondria don't function well. It causes all kinds of problems, including fatigue. And according to an article in the American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry, older adults with major depression often have rapid aging mitochondria. So we've got to deal with the depression from a more holistic perspective and then start to make our life vital again, make it relevant again. And then there's a lot we can do with a healthy diet and exercise and supplements to get our mitochondria functioning again. That's the latest on health and healing. Again, you can go to GaryAndAll.com for all types of information and films and articles, calls to action. And you can go to PRN.live and look at the wonderful list of hosts that we have, all outstanding in their field and all progressive in their mindset. And we use the term progressive differently. We're not using it as a political ideological moniker. Because a lot of people today in in Congress call themselves progressive and they're absolutely regressive. True progressivism seeks the truth without having to align with a particular ideology. So if I want the truth and my belief system doesn't provide it, I'll go outside of my belief system. If something that I've heard or said can be validated as true, then I'm going to focus upon that and not attach my my interests or beliefs to something that says, no, that can't be true. I'll give you an example of this. I have seen so many people, I'm not even including myself in my own therapeutic practice over the decades. I'm just talking about the wonderful healers I've met in my life. I've gone to the Amazon. I've gone to Brazil and Venezuela. I've sought out those who have no medical background, use no medical technology, but yet have a unique way of helping people in their healing journeys. I've seen the praying doctors in the South, not a lot, but people who do their regular medical skills and then sit and hold a hands with the patient and, and pray. You can say it's nonsense, doesn't mean anything, but it does to the people doing it and the people receiving it. I've seen organic farmers who have wonderful, lush, beautiful produce And right across the street is commercial with puny produce and destroyed soil, nutrient depleted soil. Yet that organic farmer isn't there to proselytize, but the other farmer isn't learning the lesson of their neighbor who is prospering. We don't seem to pay attention to people who are happy and healthy, but we pay an inordinate amount of attention who are angry and unhealthy. We don't look at what helps us with our problems, but rather we focus upon the consequences of those who create the problems. We have all the problems in our criminal justice system, yet we're not asking ourselves if the if the Innocence Project has found that approximately 40% of all prisoners should not be in prison, then why hasn't the federal government and all the religious organizations and all the so-called social activist organizations lobbied to put together laws that would change the entire judicial system because it's completely politicized today. So you see, we have a hard time dealing with the true underlying causes. The true progressive looks for the real cause of a problem and the real solutions without having to say, well, I can't, I can't really say that alternative Therapies like vitamin C drips will help because that would jeopardize my position within the orthodox medical community. No. Recently, I filmed uh, Dr. Pierre Corey, one of the most respected physicians, one of the most cited scientist physicians in America. I mean, other scientists and other physicians look at his work as a standard bearer of what should be done. And he said he didn't believe in any of this stuff until he started saying that that other stuff he didn't believe in, like vitamin C and zinc and vitamin D and vitamin C drips, 
actually worked better than anything else they had in fighting COVID. He's completely changed his way that he practices medicine and views science. He's both a scientist and a physician. Now that's one, one out of what, 700 to 900,000 physicians in the United States? Where are the rest? Where's the other 99.99%? They're not willing to look for the truth. They believe that whatever they're doing is the only truth. There's no discussion. There's no debate. There's no civil discourse. No. Well, the very first things I learned as a junior scientist, uh, and one that was low on the totem pole of the 16 different departments, I was in the nutrition department in anti-aging medicine, the Institute of Applied Biology, was that once a month, all the department heads would bring forth whatever their department was working on. And one day I brought forward something I thought might help humanity. And uh, everyone listened. And then the director said this, okay, Gary, you've put forward your hypothesis and the evidence supporting it. Now disprove yourself. I'm thinking, okay, I'm sorry, what do you mean? And he said, show us that you're going to put as much effort into trying to show where you're wrong as you did showing us where you were right. And that's what's missing in science. We need vigorous discussion on disprove it, disprove it. And so I went back upstairs and I did everything I could. Then I gave it to Dr. Berman. I gave it to Dr. Fiske and other people. And for the next three months, everyone I gave it to, I said, I've made mistakes. Show me where my mistakes are. At the end of this time, there were no mistakes. He said, now, now we'll go on to the next project. Good for you on this. Boy, that taught me a lesson. Wow. That's why right now, as we speak, I could have published an article on the results of our anti-aging studies, five of them, coming up with the same results, which is the bedrock of all science. Can your study be reproduced with similar to the same outcomes? If it can't, it's not a good study. People didn't disprove themselves. And about 67% of all peer-reviewed studies cannot be duplicated, which is junk science. But in any case, all day, I mean seven days a week for the last three weeks, I've had scientists of all rank finding any flaws they can in my study. And if they find something that I can't subst substantiate, even if it's true and I can't substantiate it, it comes out of the study. So at the end of this, which is coming up probably in the next day or two, the last of the challenges will have been met. Then what we have left is what gets published in a peer review journal. But that's the way it should be done. So when I share something with you, it, you should have the confidence, not just my opinion, this works. What is the proof that it works? Just imagine, where do you find that in the left or the right? Where do you find that in the blue or the red, in the ideologies? Where do you find that in communism, socialism, capitalism? You don't. All you find are adherents who are loosely bound or as tight as a cult member to a belief. So any other belief that challenges it is immediately expunged from their consciousness. Even if what you are telling them would help them, they've got to reject it and hence reject you in the process. We are extremely divided today. We are a nation no longer unified by the uniqueness of our beliefs and cultures, but rather we are defined by our tribalism and by the brutality of that separation, not seeing anything as sacred. Just think of it this way. You can't destroy someone before you demonize them. You have to show they have no value or no threat. Then you can demonize them and destroy them. Look at Germany. Look what all those German millions, tens of millions of Germans allowed to happen because they felt threatened by a false ideology. Stalinism, Maoism, Pol Pot, it goes on, McCarthyism. And we have new medical McCarthyism today. Doctors are losing their license for telling you the truth. And those who lie are being rewarded. That's why we want the independent thinker alive and well, not the group think. 
That's what we try to share with you in these programs. We're going to take a break and come right back. Please stay with us. Live from New York City, it's The Gary Null Show. And now, your host, Gary Null. 